Bienvenidos, worldwide fans of the planet. How does entertainment with an edge? I'm Ian Fuego here, and I welcome you to my namesake program in Fuego Tainment for a special double review that is going down for uh, the Airborne Toxic event, Hollywood Park, and the corresponding book by Mikel Jolet, which is also called Hollywood Park. So, man, when I first discovered the Airborne Toxic event many, many years ago, I heard a live performance, well, I watched a live performance to specify, of uh, their song Wishing Well, which is on their subtitle debut, and it was played live on the this late night show that Carson Daly, the former uh, TRL dude, had on, I can't remember if it was NBC or CBS, ABC, I don't know, it was one of the major networks, but it was like a real late night show, and he wanted to have them on there, and so, I mean, even though I was never the biggest fan of TRL or anything, I will at least give Carson props to the fact that he did, when he got his own separate show and got away from MTV, he booked some solid acts from what I remember. That's how I discovered Airborne, and basically, Everything was different for me from there. Yes, as you can see, I'm like a metal dude, but the Airborne Toxic event, man, they were a band that very quickly meant so much to me and were probably, of this past decade, my favorite new band to emerge, you know, in the 2010s, at least from, you know, I, I think it was like right at the beginning of those, but they released three incredible records in the self-titled All at Once and then uh, <clears throat> their third record, which might Oh boy, Such Hot Blood might be my favorite. It's it's tough though, because there's such beautiful tracks on all of those albums. I mean, you know, Graveyard Near the House from the All at Once, and then, I mean, Such Hot Blood, the, the Fifth Day, The Storm, I mean, Elizabeth, uh, you know, True Love, it, it, there's just, those, those three albums, I cannot stress how much they meant to me. Then, it was followed up with a, a double release of sorts, even though they weren't packaged together. The uh, songs of uh, Whiskey and, uh, oh boy, I'm trying to remember the extent of the title, but long story short, that was like an uh, acoustic album with a bunch of outtakes from the previous records or songs that had at least been worked on during those, from what I understand. And then there was Dope Machines, and I, I must admit, after adoring those first three records, I was disappointed with Dope Machines. It was. It was heavily electronic, but it was also kind of pop-centric in some ways. Uh, there was the uh, there was the Linda Perry collaboration on that song, California, that I'll admit just didn't do it for me, you know. But those three records, the first three, changed my life, honestly. I mean, did half of someone else, or half of something else, was a song that I wanted those lyrics, like, tattooed on my arm. It just meant so very much. And so, yeah, even though I listen to heavier stuff most of the time, Airborne changed my life, essentially. And so, after a five-year absence, finally re-emerging. And uh, the, I wish I had the corresponding book, as opposed to just this album here that I bought at uh, Zia Records. Shout out to the local record store and everything. But yeah, five-year absence, a book, a memoir of sorts for Mikkel, and a corresponding album. This is a, this is a hefty endeavor. This is very ambitious. And uh, I had purchased, purchased tickets for, uh, you know, a book tour that was supposed to be going down, supposed to include a signed book, Changing Hands Bookstore Phoenix, shout out to them as well. And unfortunately that performance was canceled due to, you know, the emergence of a pandemic and just, you know, the tour was postponed to next year. I mean, it was, it, it was going to be a really amazing, intimate experience and I still don't have the book yet, so I'm going to be talking about the book, I'm going to be talking about the record at least a little bit, giving some thoughts. And so yes, the, I appreciate everybody just listening to me yammer on about this band that has meant so much to me in this last decade of my life, but Hollywood Park returned to form musically, most definitely. I mean, the first song basically is the title track and it is a romping, stomping, galloping, energetic tune that is supposed to basically, I mean, just the drums alone, they embody like the galloping of the horses at this racetrack that Mikel and his father went to, you know, from the time when he was younger, uh, visiting, you know, coming down from Oregon and going to, you know, the LA area and just, you know, enjoying the hell out of his time with his dad and just, you know, placing bets and, you know, having some food and just, you know, that, that just wonderful bond that they shared over this place. And the song even talks about the fact that, you know, years and years later after he was all grown up and had seen success with his band and everything, it was eventually torn down. And yet it's just such an enthralling, invigorating song. And when I first heard it, I was like, okay, we, we are back. And I am just so, so happy. I miss this band immensely. And then in turn, it goes into uh, Brother How Was the War, which is from the perspective of his father. He had a uh, younger brother who was in Vietnam. 
And uh, that's the thing, it's tough to even talk about this album without talking about the memoir, about the book, because it's over 400 pages from what I understand, and I also purchased the audiobook for it, and that's how I was able to actually take it in, since I still don't have that physical copy yet, still waiting on that. I know shipping is all kinds of messed up because of, you know, everything going on in the world, so I, well, I have to express disappointment in not having the physical copy just yet, signed and all that jazz, and being able to see just the layout and see if there's any sort of imagery or whatever being a memoir and with uh, the intimate father-son photo that's on the front here I I hope that there's some sort of you know uh, just just visuals in there maybe pictures of him you know growing up or with his you know brother or whatever but unfortunately it's all just speculation at this particular point but uh, Mikkel reads the audiobook which I purchased on audible and just hearing him the you know a songwriter that I respect and admire so much and who has just meant so much to me with you know the work that he has done. Uh, I just, it, it was a treat, it was engaging, it was informative, and it was really eye-opening in a lot of ways because I had no idea the extent of Mikkel's upbringing and the fact that he basically spent the first few years of his life in essentially a cult that initially started for uh, you know drug rehabbers and you know people just trying to you know get off certain you know substances or drinking or whatever at least to the best of my understanding and yet it quickly morphed into something far more sinister than the original good intentions you know the road to hell you know how it's paved and all that stuff and yeah man I mean you find out that him and his older brother were basically taken from their parents and not allowed to see them because the aspirations of this particular cult were to have children be more self-sufficient and less uh, j just having to rely on parents and for that reason he actually was when t his mother basically took him and his brother and like escaped in you know the, the dead of night and so on and went and fled to you know her father and her mother's place and was hiding out before finally getting a place of her own but uh yeah it's it was it's, it was a scary prospect but if there was any sort of good that came out of this terrifying just set up and situation is the fact that the intellectual instruction was pretty profound from what Mikkel talks about you know and uh by the time he was in regular school, I mean, he was testing above average and they were trying to, you know, to shift him into skipping grades and all this other stuff. But beyond that, the, the grip of the cult was still there. They were sending people after, you know, uh, his mother and them and various other people. And there is a, there's an early uh, re recollection that he mentions about this other guy from the cult who had escaped who was kind of, you know, seeing her mother and the father was, uh, you know, down in the LA area, whereas they're in the Oakland area. And, uh, you know, he's seeing that Mikkel's father was seeing another woman that, you know, was also, you know, somebody who, you know, left and, you know, just didn't want to be a part of that as they started implementing, you know, spouse swapping and all this different craziness, which is obviously when the big red flag started to come. And that's why, you know, people started leaving, you know, and they were forbid to leave. And so if you left after it was forbidden, they went after you. And there is this kind of, you know, friend slash lover possibly of his mom who gets just beaten the F down and it's just this frightening memory that messed with his psyche at such a frail young age and you know just, Mikkel is very just just barren honest about stuff in this you know the fact that he was so just traumatized by this like he was wetting the bed after that and just having nightmares and all this stuff and you know to to lay yourself and be so so vulnerable and so honest that really takes a lot of bravery in a lot of ways and so we hear about just his mom trying to find you know a safer place for them to live moving up to Oregon and then eventually he decides that he wants to go down and live with his father as opposed to just visiting him in the summer and uh, you know then in turn as he matures and it segues into you know his younger teen years and stuff like that that's where it's about his older brother and his older brother following unfortunately in the footsteps of the father the father was uh, you know, a heroin addict who was broken out of a Mexican jail, spent time in, uh, you know, prison himself. And so it's just fascinating to hear where the inspiration for certain songs, like It Doesn't Mean a Thing, came from, you know, and to, to also even songs later on, like like Elizabeth and, you know, uh, various others. There's, it's, it's really cool while he doesn't spell out, hey, this song was about this instance in my life or this thing that happened to my father and I took that as inspiration. 
If you're a big time that Tate fan, as people abbreviate it, but I just really, it's because their name is so long, the Airborne Toxic Event, a lot of people just abbreviate them as T-A-T-E. But if you're a diehard like I am, you're just like, oh, yeah, that's where, that's where that song came from. That's when the, at least the perspective he was writing from, which is pretty, pretty cool. But yeah, there's a lot of just sad stuff with you know, resentment of his mother that he lays very, very bare for the fact that she was so traumatized by the situation in this cult that she was being far too emotionally reliant on her kids, most notably Mikkel, and so she is just devastated and yet kind of selfish when he decides that he wants to go and live with his father permanently. And so that's a big thing, and you know, even as he gets older and his brother's you know, drug and substance use becomes more profound, his is starting to take hold as well, being the younger brother and kind of you know, just going along with it, but never to the terrible degree that his brother did. And uh, it's, it's something chronicled throughout the entire book, even as he you know, gets, uh, gets his life turned around and can, does not continue down the same path of his bro and he starts studying harder and he gets into Stanford and you know you find out about just the the disillusionment that he has as somebody who rose from you know rags to not so much riches but you know just had to had to persevere and felt kind of out of place in this sort of educational institution and how even after graduation he was like do I really want to do this with my life you know and just the searching for meaning and everything and getting into it. I, I always knew that he was a, a music journalist before he segued into playing music and as somebody who had that same kind of trajectory and transition myself with you know being a print journalist, uh, music writer for you know Playtime and uh, a couple other stuff here in the southwest like writing music and then eventually segueing into other stuff and doing on camera work with heavy metal television and getting to interview some of my metal heroes and hearing about Mikkel doing the same and you know interviewing the likes of Robert Smith and David Bowie and some of the instruction that they gave him. Were the interactions possibly romanticized just the slightest bit? I'm, I'm not one to say one way or the other, but just the, the profundity of the advice that he chronicles them giving him in some of his interactions with his heroes is it's inspirational, man. It really is. And just the fact that he's still forged forward with artistic expression and just working on demos and, you know, whittling on the keyboards and on, on the guitar and just, you know, scribbling down these very just personal and laying it bare, you know, lyrics and stuff. And that was one of the reasons why I connected at such a prolific level with this group was that sort of just brutal honesty at times. And there is brutal honesty throughout this, as I said, with, you know, just, just Mikkel still having these issues, even though he's repaired as time has gone on, stuff with his mother, who uh, you find out much later in the book, ends up, you know, ends up down in Tucson with a, a man who seems to be much more caring and stuff. But uh, as opposed to hitting every beat from this book, um, I, I just have to say that I, I'm so just appreciative of the fact that an artist that I look up to the, to the degree that I do and whose music has helped me through a lot of hard times was able to just pull the curtain back and just give me a very intriguing and uh, just cool perspective about his personal life and you know I've, I've always been about these sort of uh, you know auto bio sort of things from you know whether it's the writers on the storm that Densmore wrote or even even slashes, uh, you know, auto bio that he put together. I've always really dug these. I find them fascinating. And so, you know, the, the corresponding book, even if you're not necessarily the biggest fan of the band, it's still a compelling tale of somebody feeling out of place and yet still having the, the smarts and the intellect to try to not so much reinvent themselves, but just not to go with the flow of what people expect them to do or necessarily push them towards or whatever. You know, rise above the constraints with which you find yourself in. And so, I, I mean, back to the album though, since I've just really gushed a lot about the book and how much I dug it. The album, it starts out very strong. I mean, so I, I was honestly worried with the departure of both uh, the, well, the, I, I believe the bass player was let go after the third album, and he had co-written some of the tracks on those on the second and third album, I believe specifically that I really really dug. So that was one thing. But you know he's been you know very very competently replaced, and I watched the live stream that they did the day of the release of the record, 
everybody sounded great, including um, the replacement for our uh, long-standing uh, violinist, who uh, also helped out with great vocals on stuff like Graveyard Near the House. Those bombastic videos from the second record are still some of my favorite things that I have ever seen a band do. Those were so awesome, and they did, I, I think they did the entire album for all at once, and then for Such Hot Blood, they just did a selection of tracks and stuff, but, uh, and then they did some for the first album as well, but man, those, those bombastics, they were some of my favorite things that this group did, and I really hope that maybe we will see that, you know, a return of those for, for Hollywood Park, but, um, yeah, the, the violinist left, regrettably, and she has uh, founded a uh, music education institution, if I recall correctly, but um, this, this new young lady that they brought on and that she made her live debut with the band on that uh, YouTube live stream on the day of the uh, release of the record Hollywood Park, she sounded great, the violin playing was tremendous, and uh, it's not... The, the string stuff is not as prolific on this one, dare I say, with some of the previous releases, but the songwriting by Mikel is still so strong, and I mean, the, the percussion and the, the lead guitar work from Steven and stuff, I mean, it's all, it's all great still, and uh, it, does, it does veer into some slightly poppier territory in the middle of the album, like, you know, Come On Out and that, stuff like that, but I... I was always a little bit more of the, you know, like, like ballady, angsty fan of this band and uh, in comparison with uh, stuff like, you know, like changing from the second record and stuff like that. But I know there's a lot of people who dig those tracks too, you know, so it's, but where the album stays solid in the middle and stuff, in tracks like 8 through 12, man, the, the album finishes so incredibly strong. All these engagements, it starts out more hushed and slowly building, and then it gets really aggro in the back half of the song, and it's just, it, it becomes a fist pumper so very quickly. And then maybe my favorite track from the album, The Common Touch, I mean, that's one that I have been, it's, it is like something I could see myself, you know, just in, in a bar or something, just, you know, just with a whole chorus of a bunch of friends, just, you know, it's, it's just very, anthemic and anthemic or however it's yeah, I'm probably butchering that one but uh, it is it's anthem worthy it really really is and I was reading that that's actually a song that they had debuted live like as far back as 2017 but it still feels like perfectly in place in the album cycle here and there is a great uh, you know track that also has a reprise and it's called the place we meet a thousand feet beneath the racetrack and uh, this one actually pops up and the, the cool thing about the audiobook just to jump back to that really really with the quickness is the fact that uh, they're in, in between some of like the chapter breaks and stuff like that and at various other times there is segments of music from this that pop up on the audiobook and then of course we do get you know a little bit of wishing well and it's great to hear you know, Mikkel on that talk about the formation of the band and just their ascent to success and, you know, just the perseverance and the hard work that was accompanied with that too. And even talking about the death of his adopted Jewish grandmother, who, which I, rem I, I remember him mentioning during that uh, live Disney concert, which I have the DVD slash CD of, and that's also one of my favorite concert films, like, ever. It's, it's beautiful. Some of the, the cover selections are terrific. I mean, Nah, I can't say how much I, I can't stress how much I love the Airborne Toxic event, and for this album to just be be so beautiful and so touching and so heartfelt, and have so much depth and so much meaning, whether it's songs about Mikel, about his father, uh, or from his father's perspective, as I said. I mean, and it ends with just a sweet track, a sweet ballad -y thing called True. The melodies are strong, the musicianship is, it, it has that just wonderful familiar feeling, you know, like just slipping your feet into some broken in, you know, badass boots and you're just gonna, you know, go on some, some hike and just have a, a spiritual communal experience with an artist and so, there, I mean, whereas there, there's fresh stuff on here, there is still just that, that fun familiarity that when one of your favorite artists has been, you know, gone for, for a while, it's almost like when they come back and, uh, you know, you get reacquainted, it's just like, you know, somebody who was your best friend many, many years ago, and let's say you haven't seen them for a long time, and yet after a few minutes, it's like you haven't skipped a beat, and you're just like right back in line, and it's like not a day has passed. That is how Hollywood Park made me feel. And so, yeah, this is, 
This is for me, uh, this is definitely, uh, you know, four to five. This is uh, certified Fuego, at least uh, personally for me. I typically only reserve that grading system for, uh, you know, the films that I review on here because I'm, I'm primarily a film and, you know, like books and comics and, you know, a little bit of television here and there. But how could I not review the new album by one of my absolute favorite bands of all time and my favorite band to emerge in the last decade? So uh, that's going to be the end of the proceedings today, everybody. Gracias, Aben Hanin Fuego. And you can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube like you see below. A like. Uh, a share, a, a little click the subscription and hit the bell, ring my bell, uh, that would mean a hell of a lot because of the fact that this is, you know, this is not my main YouTube gig, this is where I uh, have a little just side outlet for all of the stuff I don't cover on the big boy, but uh, here it's really just reviews of uh, everything from art house drama and like bigger Oscar contenders to geeking out on Star Wars and some comic film reviews and stuff. I do an animated Monday. I do a Retro Fuego Thursday. Uh, so yeah, I try to you know keep it nice and diverse. But if you like spectacular stuff, you need to head on over to youtube.com slash the horror show channel. That's my biggie YouTube destination where we've got over 33,000 subscribers compared to the little over Jeezy that I have here. But on that channel, we do uh, movie reviews. We do uh, comic coverage. We do video game let's plays. Uh, trailer reactions, uh, unboxings, uh, we do some makeup tutorials, comedy sketches occasionally, and I also host a show called Hail to Stephen King every Saturday. I've been doing that for, boy, over three years now and for, uh, boy, over 200 episodes. So that is certainly a labor of love. And this album, The Airborne Toxic Event, Hollywood Park, it's very evident from start to finish as well as within the pages uh, and the 11 plus hours of the book that I listened to that Mikkel and the rest of the guys put a lot of that into this just beautiful work of art as well. So I've been Fuego, y'all have been Rad Status, and until the real of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers alike and listeners here too. Say thank you for your presence here, but I'm hopeful that we get to share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, uh, read and listen to the Airborne Toxic Event, Hollywood Park.